of the session. Okay, the recording started. Спасибо большое. Very nice. Okay, I think now it's a, it's a good time to start. If you will agree that we are already on time and more people are joining in, but since we are recording, I think it's, uh, it's appropriate to start to kick off. So a very, very, very warm, uh, warm welcome, welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us today uh, at SEMS here at GSOM for our fifth episode of the SEMS Inspiring Chat series. And today, you know, like in Star Wars episode five was the best movie ever. I think uh, today is uh, probably the best episode since we have an amazing speaker with us. I have the honor and the luck to, to welcome here with us Ali Borhani. Uh, he's the managing director of 360 uh, strategic advisors uh, from London, and he is going to talk to us about storytelling and strategic storytelling and give us some amazing insights on why it is so, so important uh, as a CEO to know storytelling about the entrepreneurs. Uh, even if you are an academic or a student, you really, really need to master the art of storytelling if you want to be successful. Ali will be taking us from a very macro approach to a very micro level approach, all the way from 40,000 feet down to, to ground level, uh, giving us some insights, uh, some holistic insights, I would say. So Ali, it's really my pleasure and honor to have you here with us. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit stressed when I have such great speakers like you, you know. So thank you so much for, for being here with us today. And we really look forward to listen to your experience and wise words. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for having me. Um, there is this horse in a countryside galloping. And as he's going on a spring day, he sees this sign on the wall and says, the circus is hiring. So the horse is excited, goes into the phone booth, drops a penny, 
calls the circus and says, hello, I was just galloping. It's a beautiful day looking for a job. I saw the ad. The horse um, is waiting and the circus manager says, uh, yeah, we have three openings. Who's on the line? And says, this is the horse talking. And uh, what are the jobs? What are the openings? And he says, um, uh, we start with the tightrope walking. Can you walk on a tightrope? The horse thinks and says, well, um, I would love to. I'm a bit afraid of the height and I wear horseshoes and they're slippery. And if I fall, I'm gonna break my hip. Um, anything else? The circus manager says, what if you can jump into the hoop with fire? Can you do that? The horse says, um, I jump into the hoops. I do them greatly, but not with fire. My mane, my hair, my tail, everything will go on fire. The circus manager says, well, I'm afraid the last job that is remaining is that if you can walk on a globe and on a ball, you know, across the circus and says, well, I just told you about my horseshoes. They have nail in them and it may puncture the ball and I will fall. And the circus manager says, why the hell did you call? What is your skill? And the horse says, you idiot, I'm a horse and I'm talking to you over the phone. Public speaking and speaking is an art. It's, um, it constitutes the single most powerful weapon in a leader's arsenal. And that is what, you know, Professor Howard Gardner as well says in Harvard University. Anything you look and see in today's world is a story. NATO is a story. Um, Shanghai Cooperation Organization is a story. United Nations itself is a story. And the question for all of us is that how through storytelling we can tell new stories, rewrite some of those stories or revisit some of these stories. And the question for you and for all of us perhaps should be, should nations rewrite their own stories? Should businesses rewrite their own stories? And what sort of civilizations we are going to live in? And I'll come to that. Every civilization that has survived has not survived by the virtue of its GDP or only production, but by the insurance through the stories that have gone from chest to chest, from generation to the generation. And telling a story, many can do, but telling a story that is authentic, that is universal, that is healing, which we need a lot of that these days, and inspiring and conciliatory is not something that everybody can do. Geopolitics in itself is a story. And there are not that many good storytellers in this day and age, unfortunately, around the world. Narratives are plenty. On one side, Every time there is between the West and East, a comparison or a narrative or a storytelling, uh, give you an example, President Vladimir Putin is known in the media as the ex KGB head, but the same narrative doesn't say George Bush was the ex CIA head. So the challenge is which version of the story or narrative we are living with. Now, moving ahead, we need orators. We need the art of storytelling that is missed in this day and age. Gandhi's, Mandela's, or Abraham Lincoln's are in a shortage. So the question is, do we need more um, you know, uh, tools and technologies or do we need great orators and speakers and storytellers? And what is the role of spirituality, what is the role of harmony, what is the role of integrity in all the noise that we have today. We have a lot of noise, a lot of, I would say, distortion, but not a lot of storytelling. If you look at societies in this day and age, many of them, even the most advanced ones, um, societies and the populations are on massive consumption of antidepressants. And when you look at the healing and some of the time of crisis for nations, the people who have left and led and lived with great orators were in higher spirits because of the art of storytelling of their leaders. Companies that have great orators have outperformed the other companies where there is an 
I would say, autocratic leadership style. There is a story of this logger, the wood logger, who used to go to the jungle every month to cut a tree. And every morning he used to sit down and have a cup of coffee and sharpen his ax. And while he was doing, every time he went, whether it was windy or not, even in the most quiet days, he would hear that the leaves are rustling and murmuring as if they were talking to one another. So after many years of logging and cutting the wood, one day he asked the trees, are you guys afraid of me? Are you afraid of my ax? Because every time I come here, even when there is no wind, you are rustling, you are talking to one another. The elder tree among all the trees who were braver than the others said, as a matter of fact, we are neither afraid of you nor your acts. We're always talking among ourselves in bewilderment and in fear because the handle of your acts is one of us, it's a wood. So it is very important to remember that leaders are storytellers and leadership results in growth, not in cutting down, not in chopping or eradicating the storytellers. And remember that story of the logger. Now for you and many of you in university, the road ahead is a choppy road if you wanna think about it. We are getting into a blend of techno-capitalism where finance and technology is mixing massively. We have a post-truth era. And the terminologies that you are hearing and I am hearing and all of us are hearing are deep fake, synthetic media, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, virtual reality. And if you stack up fake, synthetic, augmented, artificial, and virtual, then the question is, where is the room for authenticity? Where is the room for originality and empathy? And as overwhelming those terms may seem, they are equally the most important opportunities ahead of you, if you want to become storytellers. A great storyteller is like an osteopath is like a physiotherapist. He creates an alignment between the moral, emotional, intellectual, and inspirational body of its audience, like a physiotherapist or an osteopath, to create that alignment. A great storyteller is a Sherpa. He would see you either in the valley of despair when you're in it, or will come with you but is able to get you out on the other side. And creating hope, the world-renowned Persian cinematographer and director, Abbas Kiarostami, I encourage you to watch his movies, has a movie called The Taste of Cherry, which won an award at a Cannes Film Festival, Palme d'Or. And he goes and says, I looked for the right character for two years, but when I found the right character, we shot the movie in five weeks only. And strategic storytelling needs the right characters, needs the right energy, is simply a skill. It's a lifetime tool that you will develop. It's essential to have. Research shows that storytelling is 22 to 25 times more powerful than facts and figures in sticking in people's memories. 22 to 25 times more than facts and figures. So if I tell you a story about heartache and pain, it will stick with you. Whereas if I tell you how many bones I broke in that injury and how many pins were in my arm, the experience sticks with you. Storytelling, is a switch that activates your sensory cortex. It's like a fermenting agent for your neural system. So it's imperative that many of us remember that we may go to a gym 
or we may go from time to time to develop uh, six packs. But what about six stories for life? What about six authentic original stories that are ours? That we can live, we can resonate, and we can recite. Write down your stories. You may think you don't have one, but I challenge you that each of you may have more than six at this very moment. Categorize them and do the mirror practice. And mirror practice is very important. We hardly look into our own eyes. You look into the mirror every day to shave, to fix your hair. Hardly I have any of that, so I don't spend that much of time in fixing my hair. But we stop looking into our own eyes. If you do one thing after this call, I want to challenge you and promise it to Professor uh, Christodoulou and your classmates. After the call, go and tell a story that you like or you think it's been captive in your ribcage, in the mirror, into your own eyes. And ask yourselves, do I believe that story? Do I feel that story in my bone? Doesn't matter what story it is. It could be from kindergarten. It could be a story of a heartache. It could be a story of a breakup. It could be a story of winning a match or something you've done recently. Stories don't necessarily have identities till you tell them how you tell them and to whom you tell them. So do that eye test. The word strategic I mean, I'm saying this in front of your professor, but you are in the hands of the master. But strategic is relating to the identification of a long-term or overall aims and interests and the means of achieving them. And if there is one most important element for achieving any strategic goal, that is storytelling. And the question is, you write all these theses, you write all these exams, but are you writing your own stories? Are you rewriting your own stories? And if you are, what are the ingredients? What is the secret sauce of a good story? There are seven in my opinion. Seven is a lucky number in a lot of cultures and in a lot of uh, mythologies. But in my opinion, there are seven key ingredients and I wanna share them with you. A good story has vulnerability, fragility in it. It has to be personal. People are much more interested in hearing how you failed. And all of us have failed. Anybody who hasn't failed perhaps shouldn't tell a story. Because what is the learning if you haven't failed? Your faux pas and your failures are your biggest assets. If you're waiting for your first million dollar to go and brag about it as a story, nobody's interested in that. Second one is humor. If you can't laugh at yourself, at your fallacies and share some of that laughter with others, people close in. They say smile is the only curved line that sets everything else straight. So don't forget about that curved line. The third one is relevance. Is that story relevant today? Every story can be relevant, but is it relevant to that moment? You know, authenticity and originality. You don't need somebody else's story. You must be interested in other people's story to listen to them, but share your own story, share your own journey and hero's journey. Empathy is very important because the art of storytelling is embracing, caressing, and bringing people together. Divisive storytelling, you have seen it around, around the world in this day and age, sadly, and that's not something that we need more of. The delivery matters. I challenge you to take any of your friends to a very good restaurant for a good steak and a good glass of wine. And the setting and the delivery is imperative. And then serve the same steak, Wagyu beef and a nice glass of wine in a plastic container somewhere. The perception is different. Delivery is not about the microphone, the light is about how you deliver it. 
how much of love you have put into that story and how passionately you communicate it. And of course, timing. Everything is about timing and how you deliver and where you deliver. One of my favorite characters is a lady by the name of Pina Bosch. She, she was a choreographer for organizing all the dances in um, you know, Broadway shows and in the States. And she has a very famous quote. She passed away sadly and says, I'm not interested in how people move. I'm not interested in how people move, but what moves them. And a good storyteller is like an earthquake. <laughs> He or she can move people. And if you can do that, you've accomplished a lot. And talking about choreography, life is a stage. And each of us is a performer. You know, each of us will sing our own song. And each of us has to leave the stage. But the stage will be everlasting. And every one of us, he or she, will sing and have to leave. And being happy, of course, is an art, but giving a message that is uplifting and inspiring is like an alchemy. Now, some of you may remember the horse at the beginning of my talk. The horse couldn't get the job at the circus, sadly, and he got older. So one day, a guy was walking in the same village and saw a sign that says, a talking horse for sale. So he said, oh, that's exciting. I'll go check him out. He went to the farm, he saw the man, you know, uh, working on the other side and he saw a lonely horse there and he says, I should check this horse out. And he went to the horse and said, so what have you done in your life to the horse? The horse looked at him and said, well, I had a full life and a full fantastic life. I was born in the Andes mountains and um, I heard it for an entire village. After that, I moved to New York City. I was working with the mounted police. I looked after the city. I kept the city safe and clean. And now in the village, I'm doing some pro bono work and um, you know, taking the kids for free rides around the country. The guy was flabbergasted. He was going crazy. He went to the owner of the horse and said, are you crazy? Why do you want to get rid of such an incredible animal? The owner said, because he's a liar. He, has done, he hasn't done any of the stuff that he's saying he's doing and has done. So authenticity is the most important thing in storytelling. Even a horse can talk or may talk, but you have to own your story and you have to live it. Thank you. This is fantastic. Uh, uh... I wish we would be in, in a more personal setting face to face to, to applaud. Uh, thank you so, so much, dear Ali. I, I really love that. I've kept a lot of notes uh, about the seven elements of storytelling, and we already have some questions. Uh, dear Victoria and Victor, am I allowed to go with, a, with, with question number one? You know? Of course, you are allowed to go uh, first. Sometimes being the academic director has its benefits, so I can go first. Please, please excuse me for that, dear guests. So I really love, dear Lee, you know, uh, your stories and your delivery and, uh, you know, the, the sweetness in your voice when you said all this. I really love it. Thanks so much. Uh, I, I have a quick question about the authenticity element that you said on, on storytelling. Um, it's my perception that when you say a story, a story, you might distort a little bit, you know, the elements because our memory usually plays tricks on us. Uh, the way we remember things is not necessarily the way they happen. We, we tend to make them better in order to have a sweeter memory than what actually happened or to make impression management maybe. So, to what extent is distortion of the story and telling a story, you know, in, in a better wrapping that actually happened uh, affects authenticity and honesty when pitching, for example, for, uh, for funding, when you say a story to an, in, to, to an investor to, to get them to follow you? I think 
there are key ingredients in any story. Um, somebody asks um, a, a chef, how do you make so-and-so um, stew with chickpeas or with lentils? And the chef said, I don't give a damn about the chickpeas or lentils. All I care about in the stew is the meat. Now, the substance of the story should not change, of course. So if you're going for a pitch, you cannot, um, you know, um, over promise and under deliver or to put lipstick as sadly it's happening these days in greenwashing and with all of the things in ESG and green investments, you will see that coming more and more out. Sadly, in the next five or six years, we are set for disappointments like mortgage backed securities, but from environmental and you know, CO2 emissions. And so I think when you go to a pitch, you have to be authentic to the actual recipe of your product, of your um, you know, um, idea for that matter. The spices, of course, can be you know, added, reduced, but the substance should be, um, in my opinion, intact. And I think uh, in storytelling, as, as an art of storytelling, every orator has his own way of delivery. But if, if you are, carrying something personal, it's very hard to debate. If I have a story for myself, it would be very challenging for all of you today to uh, counter that <laughs> or to argue against that. Or as well, Victor, Victoria, yourself, Giannis, you know, um, or Joe for that matter. Each of us have our own stories. But if you're carrying somebody else's story or a team story, you have to be truthful to what you've been bestowed as a responsibility. I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. I, 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 if, you, if, if the core message is being delivered, you know, in an authentic way, in order to, 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 according with the seven elements that you said, I think it's very important in order to be heard. And uh, thank you very much for the wonderful answer. So now, Victoria, Victor, um, I will stay silent, you know, Academics, academics, they have a big, you know, issue. They forget to stop. They like their voice too much, you know, so I apologize for that. Victoria, Victor. So sure, thank you, Yanis, and thank you, Ali, most of all. Um, we had a couple of questions that we already also received in advance, but I also want to point out that uh, everybody who has a question now spontaneously, please raise your hand or please post into the chat um, or just reach out, out to us on Telegram or anything like that, and we will deliver the question as well. Um, a question maybe that is related also to your professional experience. What, what kind of examples could you maybe give of companies who use the art of storytelling? Um, maybe some companies who used it successfully, maybe some companies who also failed uh, at storytelling. Maybe you have some examples in your mind. Well, listen, I think the list can go on, but most of the time, storytelling is now these days um, replacing marketing and positioning. And I think there is a very fine line between, even in that context, um, being authentic to what you're doing. I have two examples that I find rather interesting, and I share them with you. I mean, you can go on on um, uh, the every best campaigns of annual awards and you know of marketing etc today storytelling is replacing marketing and i think you guys and as students and as future business leaders should not mix these two but sadly or in reality because that's the case i have two uh, points to share with you Montreal has a, a famous uh, Fairmont Hotel, the Queen Elizabeth Hotel, and they had a, a suite called 1742. And this is the room where um, uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono had uh, their moment and morning of give peace a chance. So what they did is that they reopened that uh, suite and they have created uh, a stay there where people can relive exactly the experience of Yoko Ono and John Lennon. And they provide them with virtual reality goggles that the reporters come in and the music is played, et cetera, just to live that moment of that press conference. But here even, Victor, if you look at it, the credit of that story 
the credit of that story goes to John Lennon and Yoko Ono. So back to Ioannis' point, um, Fairmont is retelling the story through technology and opening the suite, but the credit of that story belongs to John Lennon and Yoko Ono. You know, so I think that was one. The second one that I really liked was um, the Land of Land Rovers, which was a campaign for the 70th year of anniversary of Land Rover, which is on YouTube and you can see it. And most of the time these days, the stories of uh, brands are associated with the glamour and razzmatazz and jazz and Louis Vuitton or Hennessy and Gucci and all of that. And I think this is about a bunch of rugged old Land Rovers and no pumpers that are still going up and going to an elevation to 3,636 meters with local people. And it shows the significance of utility in, in daily life. And in my opinion as well, the resilience of a brand that has lived for 70 years. You know, so, so I think these are my two examples that I enjoy, uh, but again, not because that it's augmented reality of that kind in Fairmont, but because a good story has a life long for centuries and decades. Now, Yoko Ono is still around. John Lennon has sadly passed away, but that story is still alive. Following up on this question, I'm quite curious, would you say that generally it is easier to tell, uh, tell a story if you have really a person representing, for example, if you look at Tesla and you have a very strong CEO, a very strong figure in Elon Musk, is it easier for companies to have such a strong figure who tries to represent a story for the company? Or would you say it's um, also recommended for companies to try and uh, create their own story independently of one strong person, let's say? I think, I think having a cult personality leader in a business is an asset and a liability. It's an asset because it's a quick, um, uh, short circuit of developing brand identity. So when Elon Musk goes on this uh, you know, podcast program and sits and smokes a joint and a pot and the whole world goes and watches, it's an immediate resonance, but then the market gets a hit and you, know, you have Steve Jobs, for instance, for that matter, you have Richard Branson from Virgin Group. The question is, what is the succession planning? and how lucky you can be to have a replication of the same level of charm or character. And I think the case of you know, Tim Cook and Steve Jobs and Apple is not necessarily something that everybody would get lucky with. So I think as much as a CEO may be a good storyteller or a great storyteller, one of his duties is to find an inspiring or ever more inspiring character to win him over or to succeed him afterwards. Otherwise, it's, it's very risky, you know, and, and I hope many of these entrepreneurs will live long to become my, much more wiser and more humble and down to earth and do more good. But God forbid, if any of them tomorrow morning is just gone, what is the board's strategy to put somebody as controversial or as um, figurative or animative as a character like Elon Musk in his place? So it's a liability and an asset, I think. Following up on the thought of um, that also the CEOs have to look for a good replacement, of course. Maybe um, I guess also many in our study group are aspiring to reach high positions of responsibility, maybe even become a CEO themselves one day. So could you give us some tips maybe how to become a good storyteller or how we could practice storytelling in everyday life and uh, what are the pillars of good storytelling? Well, I, I genuinely think that the most important element in storytelling is to be interested in other people's stories first. So every day you have an opportunity to listen to a classmate, to a family member, to a stranger on the street. And unfortunately, um, a great part of that 
blessing is uh, eclipsed because of smartphones and headsets and we have lost the art of immersing and this spontaneous serendipitous moment of talking to somebody else and learning about a world completely different than us. So everything is produced, everything is structured, everything comes through social media. And I think listening to other people's stories is extremely important. Uh, I attended a talk, um, um, I just wanna tell you uh, by a neuroscientist, if I find the notes, I will share them with uh, Professor Cristodolo and, and I will ask him to share it with you all. And the talk, I will find the link. And the professor was from um, UC Berkeley and you know, um, various studies. They conducted a 25, 30 year study about the most important activity for shooting your neurons and brain in terms of stimuli. And what is the most intensive, um, I would say, um, activation exercise for your brain? Do any one of you wants to make a guess? Telling a story? <laughs> Good one, Joe, but not. Two more, please. Come on. Maybe to somehow heat up your hands. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Maybe to heat, heat up your hands, maybe to do something like this. Good. And then one of yes. the ladies, please. I would have said the same, like using your hands. Valeria? It's coming up. Uh, you're, you're, yeah, go on, Valeria. I'm sorry, something was wrong with my mic. Yeah, so actually I was also uh, on the Joe's side with the storytelling, <laughs> so he stole my answer. <laughs> so, so no, he said the most demanding exercise on your brain, clinically proven, 30, 40 years of research, is to have a spontaneous conversation with a stranger on the street. That is when your entire system gets activated. Doesn't matter if it's a good conversation or a bad conversation, but your neurons go to 100% of engagement. So that is, that is, in my opinion, one of the most important things to be able to have these conversations. The other thing is that nothing is more painful. I think you know uh, Maya Angelou, who was a poet and is a social, uh, a political activist who in the United States. And she says, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. So the best practice for storytelling is to share your story, to start by sharing your story, you know, to, to be expressive and not to be shy away that, oh, how am I going to be judged? How am I going to be looked at? Do I look silly? Will I be, you know, don't worry about it. There are seven, eight billion people. Each of us have a story as unique as our fingerprints. No two stories are the same. So in more ways than one, you are a unique story. And it's up to you if you want to share it or not. And write them down. If I tell you something, you may uh, think I'm crazy, but I write my narratives. I write my thoughts. I write my stories. And sometimes, in a moment, I was telling you about the timing and the delivery. You write something today, in two and a half years' time, you say, wow, it's just the time that I should take this out as a story. But if you don't jot them down, how are you going to keep track? A story doesn't have an expiry date. Can, can, I, can I follow up uh, with what you just said? Is the reflection important into shaping stories? Uh, be, because, you know, it, it seems to me that I create stories when I regret things a lot. <laughs> but uh, a reflection does not necessarily mean that you regret things, but I wonder if this helps. So if you, if you, if you really think of the past, if you think of how you, you can improve things, whether this helps uh, shape stories actually. I think contemplation and reflection is very important, but if you have 
you know, I mean, if you, if you have captured an incident or, or if, if I got your question right, Yanis, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you have had a failure, you know, many times when you are in a car and the car is rolling over, it requires tremendous amount of presence to remember how you got into that situation and hardly after a car accident, anyone can say, oh, the car started rolling at 6.35 and we had five rolls and it was first on this. People remember a, a, a snapshot of the incidents, but that is why capturing these moments, happy or sad, good or bad, is extremely important, Yanis, because and that is why they make the, you know, when you are in a car accident, that's why the police come and make the drawing and uh, capture the imagery and all of that, is to see and to study it later. So that was a metaphor, but we all have had our own car crashes in life, in corporate, in studies, in family, and moments that we have made the destiny quicker than we anticipated. So what was happening that day on a good day or on a bad day? Capturing the stories is the key essence of it. Thank you very much for your insightful answers. I saw that a couple of hands were raised. Maybe, yes, Nikita. Yeah, I actually help. My name is Nikita. And I'm actually you know, wanted to continue with the topic about the companies that tell their stories, like Gucci and so on. But my question is about bad stories. Okay, like imagine you're a company, you, you're a brand, you, t you told a story. It, it is good for right now, for this time, but in 100 years, it doesn't work. It, like, for example, with Maybach, they told a story 100 years ago, but they, they, uh, the company that my brand belongs to, it's Mercedes-Benz, and they try to rebuild the brand in the beginning of 19th to Southern and the story didn't work. And uh, all, everyone remember this, the first, this, the first story that was told before. And we see many brands like, like Maybach, Bob, Hugo Boss, right? And what, and my question is here, what to do with the bad story if it was told very good at first? I think, I think uh, other than the saints and, uh, you know, um, uh, the holy characters that even they themselves in a good setting would tell and share their uh, faux pas with you. Um, ev any company, any nation, any individual may have had a checkered past. The most important thing, the most important thing is honesty and ownership. So if, if, um, like say, let's say um, um, East India Company, for that matter, in UK, have had a colorful past in you know colonies and around the world, um, or Hugo Boss for making the uniforms or Maybach. You cannot deny it. You cannot be in denial. You have to own that story. You have to acknowledge it, and you have to say, what are my key learnings from that story? And how can I move forward? Now, the fact of the matter is that some of the brands are making their own new mistakes, Nikita. And you are absolutely right. This is not just about the rear mirror view. I personally believe that, you know, asbestos was a building material some of you maybe are not familiar with, but at one point it was a magical, uh, <laughs> Um, building material ingredient and, you know, for, for, for construction industry. And it turned out to be a massive liability, right? I genuinely believe a lot of products that are coming our way or technologies that are coming our way will have their own moments of asbestos as well. The question as well is how aware we are as consumers, as business owners, as entrepreneurs, that are we trying to catch the wave because the previous unicorn did this and they made it to $1 billion? Or do we genuinely feel that, you know, my, my value integrity alignment is telling me this is not right, but because it's the flavor of the year or the decade, as a graduate, I go with it as well. So when you have something that doesn't work or hasn't worked or have been crisis in identity, as a brand, you have to own it. You cannot deny it. What can you learn? How you can communicate it honestly and to move forward. 
If you look at the museums, Nikita, right now around the world and in Western Europe and America, a lot of them are answering a lot of tough questions. A museum is a cultural center, but a lot of them having artifacts that they have to send back to the original countries where they looted these products and artifacts and stories. An artifact is a story. From 27,000 years ago in the caves, the men and women used to paint a story on the wall. So if you rip that off from an Aboriginal society and bring it to a Western museum, you have stolen their story, right? So what I'm trying to tell you is that it's not just about the brands, but it's also much bigger than that. In the cultural scene, in the you know, literary scene, what do we do about those tough questions as well? And it behooves you. It behooves you, Joe, uh, you know, Igor, uh, Victoria, Victor, Tatiana, as the future business leaders of how you want to address these complex issues. I hope, Nikita, your question was answered to your satisfaction. <laughs> Perfect. Um, yes, Jaroslav? Yeah, I really enjoyed uh, your statement about the fact that uh, nowadays storytelling is replacing marketing. And uh, I have a question in this regard. Um, how to uh, create a proper story for a new brand, for example, for, for a new startup? Is it better to use your product as a subject of your story or your team or uh, the founder? Well, Yaroslav, I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with the exact product you're talking about, right? But um, um, I'll, 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 I'll genuinely tell you, uh, how do you say, um, and, I, and I use my bald head quite often in my speeches and talks out of strength, not out of weakness. If I am promoting a product for hair care, I don't think I would be a fantastic ambassador to talk about the hair care product, right? <laughs> so I either have to find one of my teammates who has a much more handsome, good looking hair, uh, head full of hair, or I have to focus on the product without putting myself at the forefront. So I think the correlation between the product, the founder and the team is an identity question. It's not a black and white. It's about what you wanna accomplish and sometimes, sometimes you have to find champions among ordinary people who become your brand ambassadors, not just the celebrities. I think a lot of corporate social responsibility and social impact companies that are springing up as well are getting caught into, you know, association with celebrities. But many of the heroes are on the street, you know, so how do you find much more interesting, much more authentic campaigns about a product with ordinary people. So if you have, um, I don't know, a, a product that goes to help a single mom, timing management, I don't know, nourishment and nutritional factors, or it's a food product, you know, so if you're not married and you're pivoting for a product that is related to a family, again, what is the resonance there? You know, what is the, what is the history? What is the experience? So I don't know exact context of your product, but I'm more than happy if you like, and uh, after the call to share my thoughts separately with you and see if I can add value. But I think the correlation of the founder and the product should have a story. Now, if I go and find the product that I can regrow my hair and regain my hair, I would be a fantastic ambassador. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I also saw that Alexandra posted a quite interesting question on the chat. Um, we can tell Alexandra to, 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 to ask the, the, the question herself. Alexandra, where are you? I'm here. Yeah, I'm just without my camera today. Um, ah. Yeah, I had a question regarding the match between the story and its audience. So quote to the question on the chat. Um, what about intercultural differences? Because uh, the same story wouldn't work in the same way on media, the Asian market and the European market. So how should a company approach storytelling when it's just operating globally and in different cultures? Well, Alexandra, I think it even starts before that. Sometimes when you're talking about a product in particular, the naming of a product can completely be different, you know? So it's not just even the story of it, the naming. And I've seen a lot of companies 
falling into the trap. There's a famous uh, French cheese, I'm not going to name names to save myself from embarrassment, that came to some Middle Eastern countries. And uh, the name of the cheese, when they launched a product without knowing and sending it to the market, was name of a private part of a man. So how can a woman go to a supermarket and ask for a cheese that is branded that way? Forget the brand story, even the name and the label sometimes is overlooked. Uh, but as well, I think the story of a campaign is different than a story of humanity. The story of heartache is universal, Alexandra. The story of reaching and helping people is universal. The brand and the campaign, I agree with you. In certain cultures, um, certain you know, social, uh, cultural norms are accepted and in certain ones they're not. And I think if you are a global product or a universal entrepreneur, you cannot expect to go to these markets and ask them to adapt to your product or to your campaign. So you have to adapt to them. But at the personal level, uh, the story of a father who has lost a son, the story of somebody who has been saved by a bunch of dolphins while surfing, these are universal. So I think storytelling has this um, a beauty between personal, corporate, universal. And the corporate can find itself sometimes at odds with the personal or universal, but the personal and universal are always connected. Okay, thank you. Very Did I answer your question? Yes, so it's more about approaching it from universal concepts this way and then looking for local, let's say, peculiarities. Adaptations, your local adaptation. Yeah, I agree. Very nice. Um, Victoria, maybe you also have a question to ask. Not right now, okay. Then um, I will also ask a question about um, for example, I'm from Germany and I have the impression that the art of storytelling here is not so appreciated sometimes. I feel like politicians are not good storytellers anymore here. I, we don't have really those business leaders that are very good storytellers. So yeah, I'm not sure what uh, you could recommend, maybe especially for the Germans, let's say, or people who generally struggle with storytelling. What is going wrong or what, what can be improved to change the situation? I think, I think I had the pleasure of working both for the Dutch companies and um, you know, American companies and as well the um, Germans. So I used to be the director of corporate strategy business development for Bosch and Siemens. And I'm quite familiar with this conundrum that you're sharing with me, Victor. The challenge is um, the, the infatuation and um, I guess um, connection to perfection has hampered that element of playfulness. So the Germans start the meeting normally apologizing for the 0.01% of the gap between the perfect and where they are. So they are at 99.9% .9 of perfection, but they start the meeting with apologizing for that 0.01%. And with the Dutch, it was different. When I was working with Philips, there was a sense of playfulness. I think it's not necessarily something that cannot be changed. And I think there are two ways of looking at politicians and leaders. Today, unfortunately, unfortunately, and I don't know, you guys are the future generation, there is a shortage of statesmen, stateswomen who are storytellers. Now, if you look at your chancellor, whom I greatly respect, and I hold her in a high esteem, at least from my opinion as an outsider, Angela Merkel is a pair of steady hands. But it's like being in a car that you know you're going to drive safe for 12 hours, and there's not even a single joke and no stopover. We have to get there fast, yeah. And <laughs> there is no humor in the car. So, so, so that's one side of it. The other side is that I think if we had storytellers at the political level, Victor, the world wouldn't be in the state affairs that it is. And part of the deficit is not in the next 
car and electric vehicle and Bitcoin and all of that. I think a great part of the focus for nations should be in finding people who are greater than life, are inclusive, are universal, and I would say social, economic, political healers. Otherwise, none of these gadgets will help us. And as a culture, I think with Germany blending and opening and as, as controversial as it may sound at the home front, with receiving more people from around the world, eventually this uh, metamorphosis and interconnection of this social cultural stew will have infusion of the flavors from other parts of the world. So I think that is the hope. And of course, the greatest hope is people like yourself, Victor. Thank you very much. Very interesting answer. And I was also curious to follow up on this because I also read um, in the information that you sent us in advance that some of the greatest storytellers, let's say, were billions, you know, like uh, people not necessarily with the best intentions. So what do you think about like morals or ethics that come along with if somebody has the great ability of storytelling and um, how can we ensure that uh, it's not misused in a way? I think on that note, the most important thing is not if, if you have somebody who's a great storyteller and is um, somewhat um, in a position of being an autocrat, a dictator or a villain and has a podium or a platform, you're dashed too late, I'm afraid to say. So I think in order to avoid future storytellers who could cause a great damage to the world, again, the responsibility comes back to nourishment, pastoral care, and childhood. If you look at Mussolini, if you look at Hitler, if you look at many of the characters who have been controversial in the history of mankind, many of them have been deprived from various elements and above at a certain age. So the formative years of humanity are extremely important. And I think that is extremely important if we want to develop good storytellers of the future, we have to be sharing with them good stories today. So the role of education, the role of family is extremely important. By the time you have divisive characters like Trump in the States or Bolsonaro in Brazil or anybody else for that matter around the world, you're too late. The past four years cannot be regained by any of us. Neither by you, nor by Ilyas, nor by, you know, Martin, Elena, Daria, none of us can regain that four years. What we can prevent is to hopefully plan for the next 10, 15, 20 years and make sure that we have storytellers that once behind the podium they can heal and bring people together. And I don't want to get into morals of the life and all of that, but I think you guys as a young generation should not get carried away by a lot of distractions and remember how important it is to develop, to form and shape strong families for yourselves. Thank you very much. Very, yeah, answer. I agree with it. Very good. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience at this point? Uh, yeah, just firstly, thank you, Ali. It was really interesting. Um, I guess storytelling just in anything makes you a more interesting person in any setting, whether it's business or personal. Um, just, I guess, mainly, maybe just, do you have any good books or anything like that to recommend? Because I, like you said, it's an art that needs to be practiced. Uh, listen, I, I believe that a lot of uh, this modern day management books are uh, more of, I would say, flavors. If I were to... I was thinking maybe, sorry, sorry, just but like on an individual level, not so much like the business level. At an individual um, level, my, my inspirations, personal inspirations from storytellings, a lot of them come from autobiographies, but not of the modern, uh, how do you say, political uh, uh, characters. I would say if I were you, I would read the books of, you know, um, the, the, the mentors of the current generation. 
you know, so I would read about, not that I'm saying that he was a great character or as such, but I would read about Helmut Kohl, you know, I would read about a generation before, I would read about people who were able to heal, I would read about Mandela, I would read about Gandhi, I would read about Abraham Lincoln, that I think was one of the greatest storytellers. And one of the things in storytelling, Joe, is the traditional uh, literature, the, you know, and, and, and the poetry, as crazy as that may sound, uh, the Pushkin, the Dostoevsky's, you know, the, the, the traditional literature of any country is its insurance against tyranny. It's against, uh, how do you say, um, abnormalities. And the more you read about the old text, the better you become as a storyteller. And you may say, why? Because at that time, there was nothing else to be told as a story other than the text. So some of the best stories are captured in what we are leaving behind and distracted by TikTok and I don't know, WeChat and... <laughs> So that is that is my suggestion, Joe. But I'm happy to put together and go through my library and shoot an email to Johannes and uh, give you some of my favorite ones and, and 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 to share it with you all. Lovely. Thank you so much. So we have, we have time for one more question, unless there is any burning questions, because we have read already one hour, and I, I know Ali's time is really precious. So, Victor, do we have any last questions? Um, yes, one question from the audience was, uh, how could storytelling also help if we think about GSOM, the Graduate School of Management in St. Petersburg, how could storytelling help a business school in a way? Well, I think business schools historically in the past 20, 25 years have been all vying and competing for endowments and for increasing their tuitions and for attracting international students. I think what is most important is that when you look at your school uh, and your placement today in the world uh, with uh, this Heartland and Eurasia and the Belt Road Initiative and what is the future of the planet? What is the future of your positioning? If the past 50 years was about West and Western capitals and Europe and United States, does being in St. Petersburg and in your school today of any relevance? And are there any stories to be told around that? Are you the next hotspot, despite all the controversies, all the sanctions, all the problems? Is this the place for congregation of dialogue, ideas, storytelling, and new collaborations between East and West? And if West has failed build, building these bridges, can East build them? And if East can build them, can your school be that builder? Very nice answer. I like it very much. I think from uh, my side, I covered most of the questions that I received. So thank you very much for your time. It was a very insightful and interesting session. And I will leave the last words to Yanis. Okay, thank you very, very much, uh, dear Ali. I think also the last answer was fantastic. I am receiving many amazing comments and feedback. I will share them with you later on uh, in various chats, you know. Uh, and uh, thank you so, so much from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to be here with us at GSOM, SEMS. Uh, we're really lucky to have you. And I extend the invitation to collaborate further in the future together with the blessings of the higher authorities. And uh, once again, I would like all of us to give a big round of applause to Ali. Thank you so, so much for being here with us. You have many virtual uh, <laughs> uh, ways of applauding. You know, many, many hands go up, dear Ali. Thank, Thank you. you so, so much. It was very inspiring. It was, ve it was an eye opener. And in many cases, jaw dropping. I learned a lot and I wish you all the best for your future endeavors. Thank, thank you, you very so, much. So I want to thank you, um, Yanis and uh, Dr. Olga Dergonova and all of you for um, taking the time out of your busy studying schedules and the quarantines, wherever you are. Um, I want to leave you with three H's, H3, which is health, home, 
and hope. And if you are healthy and if you have a home, which basically means somebody back home loving you or you're among the family, and if you have hope, the rest will follow. So promise me to start that story writing and do that mirror exercise. And I hope to see you all in flesh and blood very soon somewhere around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank have you very much. Evening. Yeah, thank, thank you so you much. All. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Have a lovely evening and see you soon. Thank you. Good night. Good night.